everyone and welcome to this session of the Athletic Women's Football Summit. I'm Dr. Donna Dehan. I'm uh, joining you from The Hague in the Netherlands and I'm thrilled to, um, to be sat in a virtual room with these uh, three brilliant, intelligent, articulate, uh, passionate women. So I'll take a moment to introduce them. We've got uh, Maggie Murphy, who's joining us from the UK, from England. She's a general manager at Lewis FC and director of communications at Equal Playing Field. So thanks for joining us tonight, Maggie. Thanks, Donna. Nice to be here. We've got Sarah joining us all the way from New York. Sarah Dwyer-Schick is a soccer coach and sport fall advocate and the founder of the Sports Bra Project. And we'll talk more about bras in a little while. So again, thanks for joining us, Sarah. Thanks for having me. And then we've got Kalinda Fogel. Denmark, and she's the founder and director of Girl Power Organization and commercial coordinator at FC, you're going to have to help me here with the pronunciation, Nordjandeland, is that correct? Nordjandeland. Nordjandeland, okay. <laughs> and again, thank you for joining us. And I just want to take a moment to say when I, when I read out like our different roles, right, and our different titles within football, this is like, this is serious stuff. We are women passionate working in football with just different roles and different experiences and I really want to kind of bring that in our, into our discussions um, today but I wanted to maybe start us off in a slightly different direction so we know that the the focus of the women's summit is about the women's football is serious business with enormous untapped potential and I think we can all agree on that. But I wanted to start our conversation uh, in this session by talking not about women's football, but about women in football. Yeah. And maybe start by talking about our experience of what that's like being a woman in this space. So maybe Maggie, you can just start us off by just sharing a few things about what it's like being a woman working in, in football in the UK. Yeah, well, I guess... Um... For me, it's a it's a little bit different because Lewis FC is such a welcoming uh, environment for uh, for women. You know, a lot of people will know a lot about our ethos and our principles and our values, which all centre around um, equality, but also social good. Um, and so, therefore, I hate hearing about friends or colleagues or you see things on social media where um, our, women I know are treated differently or in a, in a negative way because I just don't have that and I have the full support of the people that I work with and the full support of the board. Um, and I'm even aware of the fact that, you know, my opposite number in other football clubs are constantly struggling in a way to get more recognition or uh, more support for the work that they do. So I'm actually in an in incredibly um, privileged environment. That's, that's not to say that I haven't had experiences in the past where I've been asked to um, pour the coffee when I've been a speaker at a conference, at a sports rated conference. Um, or I've been kind of, uh, yeah, there's there's a constant stream of small things like, oh, you work here, do you do the admin? If I have a visitor to the office from, from outside or, um, oh, do you like football then? Um, <laughs> just little things like that. that I'm, I'm okay now, I rise above it, but those daily things are still there, even though I am the general manager of the club. Um, but I have to say that my experience is actually overwhelmingly positive from my current role. Great, that's good to hear. So thanks for sharing that. Kalinda, what about for you in Denmark? What's it like being a woman in football over there? Um, I'm working in the FC Norseland Football Club where they have, they are the professional um, uh, league club, like where they have men's football in, in, a, in a first league in Denmark. They play, and now uh, since 2018, they launched women's football in their structure. So the the club is really working hard to integrate women's uh, and men's football and it's it's first club in Denmark that um, they have uh, the first uh, foot professional football club that they have uh, women's football in their structure of course like being the first and and starting something totally new it's um you as a woman you like you feel, feel there is like a lot of things that need to be changed there is a lot of work to be done and, uh, and in, a, in a very male-dominated uh, industry, it, football itself is a male, very male-dominated industry, which is made by man for man. And we are the ones that we are trying to change. There are things that we have to, uh, for example, in terms of like how to treat women's football and how to see it and how like the facilities, all these things that need some needs extra effort. Uh, and also, for example. 
in this industry where it's very limited opportunities for women and um, especially for coaches, for referees, um, we, it's a struggle. It's a daily struggle, uh, struggle for, for the club itself and also um, for, for this industry because, uh, for example, in Denmark, if a, a club like FC Norseland wants to do something different, then the league is not supporting, then the federation is not supporting, they are not aligned, and then the media is not supporting. So it is like it is a challenge and it takes time to... So like everybody join and the stakeholders join so we can see the improvement in women's football. But it is a struggle. Okay, thanks for sharing. And Sarah, how about you? I'd say in somewhat two different worlds a little bit um, on the social media side and being able to connect with so many women um, that are working in the game has been amazing over the last years. But working as a coach within the US, we have more girls playing than there ever have been, but the numbers in coaching are stagnant, if not dropping um, at the college level and at the youth level too. Um, we're seeing lots of young girls play and come in as young coaches, but climbing that ladder and getting into higher level coaching roles or getting into decision-making roles within administration or within the um, business structure, it, there's a drop-off. And I think that's the frustrating part where you're, you know, we've been at this long enough and I'm still the only woman in the room a lot of times. And the one who has to raise her hand and says, but what about the women? And you're like, isn't this part of the integrated part of our conversation yet? So I think it's exciting to see the growth and exciting to see programs like Lewis FC and, and um, taking those strides, but also realizing that, you know, there's still other areas where, you know, I get handed the roster or I don't get handed the roster and my assistant coach gets handed the roster and it's always asked, oh, did you play or does your kid play? That's the newest one because I got to a certain age. So now it's, of course, not me that likes soccer, but oh, are you here because your son or daughter plays? And you're like, no, <laughs> I'm not. It's actually me. <laughs> yeah. And I think it's interesting listening to the what's great about this panel as well is we've got so many different national you know, contexts to talk about it. Although it's a global sport. It, we still experience it differently in, in different mm -hmm. countries. And, and in context of women's football, that's predominantly because of how women are positioned within sport, within those different mm -hmm. countries. So it's, it's not the same experience for everybody. Um, I know when we did research with European federations, um, that when we were, we were asking them about women in leadership positions, in board positions in, at national federations, mm -hmm. we didn't ask any questions about women's football. We were asking about women in football but the responses would always be, well, when women's football is more popular, then we'll get more women board members. Mm -hmm. Like they can't differentiate women in football mm -hmm. or the knowledge that we may have about football full stop mm -hmm. or the knowledge that I might have about finance because I have an MBA and I can manage your books and I don't actually need to do anything about football to do that role. You know, it's this association with it being a space for men and that men are the experts in this space to the point that women sometimes are invisible and Sarah I wanted to kind of segue this into women are so invisible that they don't always get all the equipment that they need to play sport. I think that invisibility is the reason why the sports bra project exists it's a simple piece of equipment and at the surface that's what we do is provide that piece of equipment so that women have more access to it and girls have access to playing but in reality if women were in decision making roles we wouldn't need to exist and there would be that conversation it would automatically be we're ordering socks we're ordering shorts we're ordering jock straps we're ordering bras it's part of the equipment and i think that's you know we're just the fact that we exist is a symptom and how much it's resonated with people is that you know we're meeting the need at some level of women coming into sport into football in particular but we're missing something in the fact that women aren't involved in the decision making roles so things that or aren't as often involved. So things that would normally just be a normal part of conversation now become an extra or a special interest or something along those lines. And um, so that's, so it's a piece of equipment for anyone uncomfortable right now. If you're a guy sitting in the room, it's just a piece of equipment. Think of it like a pair of socks. <laughs> and Maggie, do you think that, because you talked about your experience mm. is based on where you are. So your club and mm. Lewis has a very equitable mm -hmm. culture. Is that, does that come top down? Is that because the board has equality? How, how does that work? Why is that the experience that you have at your club, do you think? Well, I think, I mean, the club took a decision uh, in 2017 um, to split their revenues equally between the men's side and the women's side. That's often understood to be pay parity. So when people talk about Lewis, they often talk about us as paying the men and the women the same. Um, but actually, it was 
a little bit, it's a bit more ingrained than that. It's a bit more nuanced. Um, the money that we make, we feel like we are genuinely hashtag one club. And so therefore the money should be split in, in that kind of way. Um, so that had the impact of um, us having the same marketing budget. And so once you then invest the same in marketing, um, it, you generate more returns quite quickly. Um, and so within two years, the women's attendance had quadrupled. It's now the same. Last season, it was actually on average a little bit higher than the men's um, attendances after just two or three years. So um, it just proves that when you put the, the money in, it comes out. But I think one thing that really strikes me about your you know, was it top down or was it bottom up? Um, it was led from uh, from a board perspective. Um, and in fact, the members of the board, when they brought it in, were a little bit embarrassed, or I've spoken to a couple of directors who feel embarrassed that they were so late to it. Um, because for the club's perspective, you know, it's, it's had 10, 11 years of community ownership. So it's 100% owned by the fans, by the community. Mm -hmm. And so they've done all these other things on social justice and, and social good. And, you know, we'd have a strong anti-gambling advert stance, for example, because we only want ethical sponsors. And so there's lots of other things. And in some ways they were really um, regretful, a little bit embarrassed that um, they'd been so late to the gender equality piece. Um, and I think also they thought that in 2017, you know, we, it wouldn't be the case for long. So by going first, they thought that it was going to be, a, you know, a trigger effect. I can't believe that, you know, it's 2020 now. So it's only three years, but still three years. And we're still the only club in the UK, the only club in Europe, for example, that, mm. that does it. So, um, yeah, it's that it was actually the top down. So it did come from leadership. And I think that's, uh, I think that that was important for the club and where it was at the time. I think that's really, excuse me. I think that's really interesting how you're saying that Lewis felt that they were late to the game mm -hmm. but like I'm here going yes we've got someone that's joined the game that's like leading the forefront again from a mm -hmm. cultural perspective like you said the only team in club in Europe that's doing this why mm -hmm. why is Lewis felt that they were late to the game but we we're all going thank goodness somebody's stepping mm -hmm. up why, why is that do you think this is to anybody I think, really, it's, I I think it just um I think it takes bold decision making and, and quite a big um, role in terms of leadership. And it took people, people knew that there was going to be criticisms, for example. Um, and, and we have faced criticism. There's lots of people that don't really like it or have questions about it or are very, very sensitive about a penny that might look like it's going in one pot and should be in the other. And, you know, and, and, and you know, being very open. I think there have been experiences where, um, people have felt that, you know, the men's results have suffered because of, uh, and therefore it must be to do with, you know, the, the women's side or something. So there are, there are it's not perfect. It, there's there's still lots of tension. Um, there's still people that are not fully behind it. But at the same time, um, something that I don't think we as a club have been able to do, and it's not really our role, um, there has been a huge impact in the town around us. Um, and I don't think that anyone's really analysed the impact of one club taking that stance on its locality. But I hear people um, talking really positively about uh, the women's first team, like the players and like they're seen as role models. They walk around the town. People know their names. Um, you know, they want selfies. They want autographs. Or and Because our players are very community engaged. They run uh, community sessions with their own schools. Um, and, but also like uh, an example from about a year ago, I was in the pub watching an England game, men's game. And there was a guy next to me just uh, uh, kind of chatting away and ended up um, telling me without knowing who I was, that he was gonna go down to the dripping pan the next day. Cause he, he's never been, he hasn't been in years and years and years, but he heard that the women are playing and he heard the women were all right. In fact, they're pretty good. And he then started telling me how proud he was that he is from Lewis and Lewis is the town that had this club. He didn't know who I was. And I was just like, oh, I wish I could capture this and like put it on video and, and show people that this is, this is the social impact mm -hmm. that you get from uh, equal treatment and equal value. Uh, and and like, there's a, that's a huge impact, I think, on society that, yeah, you can't always capture when people ask for your uh, followers and your stats and your mm -hmm. ROI and all this. Like, what about what about this guy and, and his pride, I guess? Yeah. yeah, and I think that's definitely, that that that's value as well, isn't it? Like mm -hmm. you said, it's hard to measure. And I think in all the conversations we're having, a lot of the conversations we have about women's football, it comes back to 
the the value as in well they don't earn as much they don't bring in as many crowds they Mm -hmm. don't bring in as much sponsorship and I think it's a very I understand it from a business point of view but it's a very narrow-minded perspective on on Mm -hmm. where we're at because there are those other value elements like you just said Maggie that 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 are worth so much more than that and you mentioned then about um being able to to put it in a video but we do have a video from your club so i'm going to ask ed if he can just play that for now how do you tell your daughter that even if she trains really hard develops her skills and learns how to score goals like carly lloyd she's only ever going to be worth as much as one of gareth bale's fingers or possibly two of wayne rooney's I think we can all guess what she's going to think of that. How do you tell your daughter that even if she shows the same skills, the same commitment, trains just as hard and cares just as much, she's always going to be valued less than her little brother? This is clearly going to be a very difficult conversation for you both, which is why we've decided it's time to make a stand so that none of us have to tell our daughters this type of stuff. Lewis Football Club is going to be the first pro or semi-pro club in the world to pay its women's team the same as its men. Partly because it's just the right thing to do for all of this lot, but partly so that you'll never have to tell your daughter why she's always going to be worth less than her brother. Sounds like a bit of a win-win, doesn't it, really? Equality FC. A level playing field for women. Awesome video. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I think that just captures that. I mean, I see that in my heart. I have, as you saw, a son, another one, and a daughter. And that just rings home so true to me in terms of why. What, how can I tell my daughter she's not going to earn the same as her brothers or she's not valued the same? And sport is such a mirror of wider society and other things that are going on that I think it's so important that we have these conversations and we ask why, why don't we pay the same? Why don't we value the same? Kalinda, what's your uh, thoughts on, on watching that video and how that might uh, you know, uh, resonate in, in where you, you're from in your club or your country? Uh, I really love it. It's, it's, uh, I always, um, whenever I see development and improvement in women's football, it makes me very hopeful for the future generation and, and so many young girls that they are planning or they are, they are dreaming to make football as their career. For example, like uh, I, this re- video reminded me of uh, one of our um, uh, double hater games that we had at FCN. Uh, um, for example, of course, uh, our, most of our games are not, uh, the women's games are not uh, streamed uh, in TVs, and uh, unfortunately, so the visibility is very, very bad. So that's only the only channel sometimes that uh, the women's football is shown from the, from the club's channel, uh, SOMI channels. So we planned um, uh, last year a double header game where our uh, men's uh, and women's foot, uh, team uh, played um, like one after another. So our um, our fans from men's team, um, they stood to, to watch the women's game. And then from that time, we have loyal um, fans that they come every game. And they, they what they are saying from their feedback is that we love watching women's football. We enjoy coming to women's game. It's because we feel connected to the players. It's like, it's so real. We feel like it's, it's, they are one of us and we are one of them. They, are, they appreciate, they see the value of like us coming here and our time. Um, and sometimes they even travel to, to, the, to, to the part that where, for example, they play away games. This is the most beautiful thing. That's why it's very important to to bring more visibility around women's football. Women's football is more with uh, not so much materialistic. It's a real thing. It's, uh, it's more emotions and, and feelings are involved. And once the people see that, they will come in the stadium. They need to watch it. They need to, to see women playing football. They need to see the talent of, of women. That's, um, that's why, unfortunately, for example, one of the examples here I want to give is um, the first league in Denmark. Um, that they have made some sort of contract with 
one of the TV channels, um, and they are very proud of saying that now the Women's League is actually live streamed in TV. So now we are asking which what TV you are watching, uh, like showing uh, the women's game. It's one of the TVs that you need a special code and a special application to apply to to actually have the access to watch that game. So that's um, like a tick mark in the box. Or some of the clubs or or federations that they say we have women's football, but it's like just a tick mark to just make sure okay we have women's football and that's what we want to make our image good. Um, but that's not visibility. For example, if we want our fans to watch the women's game, we cannot argue, we cannot just like so many barriers to watch that game. Um, these are the challenges that, for example, in Denmark, the women's football is facing. And the other challenge, for example, right now, during the corona um, situation, where, for example, the men's league um, decided that and they, every week before the game uh, that the, the men play, they have to uh, give the corona test so to make sure that they are safe. And whereas, for example, the women's league, they say every second or third day you can go. And it's up to you. So if, for example, a club wants to take women's football serious, want to professionalize women, whereas uh, the league don't want to do that and they don't want to take this serious or the, the federation is not taking serious. So it's like the women's life and women's health is not very important these are the challenges that um that the women see themselves like we are less valued um if the club wants to take us serious then the league is not taking us serious um these are the, the issues that um unfortunately is just a tick mark in the box um in denmark here and i think i mean i work in in the, in the border sense in the space of diversity equity and inclusion and I see a lot of companies outside of sport, a lot of corporates approaching this issue from that tick box perspective, mm -hmm. whether it's Black Lives Matter or equality or whatever it is, it's we need to have a head of diversity because this is an issue now. But Maggie, correct me if I'm wrong, but what I hear from your story is not is more of a, a cultural, the right thing to do as opposed to, oh, well, let's have a women's team. It feels more organic and more embedded in your culture that equality is, is, is beneficial for everybody. It's not just we're doing this for the women's team. It's beneficial for your club and for the local area. And it mm -hmm. seems to have much more of a like value-driven culture. Is, is that right? Or? Yeah, well, I think so. And I think that that's not to say that everything at the club started in 2017. So, you know, there had been a women's team for a long time and, the um, and you know, there had been great progress and the women's team had been really successful in, in the leagues and stuff. So there was already a, an interest forming which probably provoked the question anyway to the directors going oh hang on a sec like there's this this thing here and you know people like it and are following it um but i think the 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 really important thing is probably around the the community element like we are really embedded in the community um like I say, it's community owned. Anyone, in fact, anyone watching can become an owner and then you have a say in, in the elections. So, um, so so with that, you have a relationship and you've got a bit of a contract with your community, with your supporters, um, including with the supporters that are in, I think, more than 30 countries. Like they, they ascribe to our principles and our values. And I think that helps set your course um, because if you didn't have that kind of constant feedback, then... Uh, then you are just thinking about uh, maybe money and value and uh, money in, money out. And I think that that being enshrined in the community is, is probably the really important thing, along with having principles and values. And I think that sometimes you, you know a club, like clubs have personalities, don't they? You know, you know what a club stands for. You can, uh, for good and for bad, right? Mm -hmm. And so I think that, you know, the, the clubs that understand that, uh, they're maybe the ones that we can work on a little bit more on their on their women's side um but it's really about that contract like it's not just a club is not just the 11 players on the pitch and the club is not the directors and the club's not the staff the club is everything it's like all everything all wrapped up together yeah and that brings me back to you guys we were talking about earlier and I was thinking about fans because we have quite a traditional old-fashioned model that women want to watch women's football or it'll only be women watching mm -hmm. women's football and and listening to your conversations 
that's that's not that there is a market people want mm -hmm. to consume women's mm -hmm. football and Sarah I wanted to bring this into the American context because mm -hmm. football soccer over there obviously for women is a hugely popular sport mm -hmm. and there's a big audience that want to consume it so can you tell us a little bit about how you how you view that from the America perspective maybe I think there's even though we, it looks to the outside a lot, like we're so much further ahead and in so many ways we are and the opportunities to play are amazing. I'm so jealous of like the 12 year old girls. I would have killed to have any of those opportunities when I was younger. Um, but as you know, some of the, as Elise and some others were talking about earlier today, some of the money just isn't there to push that forward. We know there's a market. We know there's interest. We, you know, you see it in your own networks. You see it on the social media networks. But it still still needs to make that step for the bigger business world to understand. It's not just the right thing to do, but this is also good for business because this is a hugely untapped market. And if you put something forward, whether it's a product on the field or whether it's a, a a, um, merchandise for a fan and you tailor it in the right way to the girls and women, you make it their size, you make it in a women's cut, you make it available, you're going to have an incredibly loyal, you know, I, we're all nodding with certain things that came up recently that were the non-women's cut available. We won't name the country, but because um, we'd all like to go there in 2023. But uh, <laughs> I think it's it's one of those things that like, like for us, once you see that an a, a organization like Lewis is supporting the women equally, there's backing, and I think I'm imagining Maggie, you've seen that, and it's not ba just backing locally; it's backing on a global scale. And I think for us, you know, we're so far we have so many more opportunities in, in playing, and so many more opportunities than in a lot of countries. But I think there's still that undervaluing and that underrepresentation, and it kind of all goes together um, that we still need to address and keep pushing it forward. And, Keep making those things and hoping that everyone has boards like this FC where you know oh you know we want to do the right thing um and it's good for business too yeah i think that, that, that brand that i was gonna say that brand loyalty i think is yeah. is really interesting because i i can't help but think back again to america with the mm -hmm. nwsl mm -hmm. with, you know with the with the team with the fans doing the drive-by and gifting the packs of budweiser to the players <laughs> and I was looking at that and I was like, guys, look, like there's this sponsorship thing. Like I think people yeah. that when companies back women's sport, mm -hmm. we see that and we like, we will pay that back <laughs> multiple times. You know, fans Absolutely. buying the beer for the players, like it, it's kind of the wrong way around, but <laughs> that's that. And it just, I find it kind of nuts in a way that the, the big sponsors, mm -hmm. well, not even big, but like sponsors aren't kind of like buying in yet because mm -hmm. I think that, the numbers might not be the same as in men's sports, but I think the loyalty is there. And I can't tell you the number of times that I've actively tried to spend money on sports products or events or whatever it might be um, and not being able to because the product didn't exist for me in my size. Or um, So I, I'm, I was back in Scotland for the Women's World Cup last year. My parents are both from Scotland. I have the English accent. Um, but I actively tried to buy the shirts and could not get the shirt in time because they'd already sold out. Uh, you know, we, this was more than a couple of weeks before the World, kick, uh, World Cup had, had kicked off. It's just a tiny example of, you uh, know, I'd already gone. I was living in London. It's not like I, I wasn't even living in Lewis at the time. I'd gone to all the sports shops. They didn't sell, they didn't sell any of the women's tops, mm -hmm. not even the England shirt. Mm -hmm. And then, so I went online. It was sold out online. And I was like, you know, Adidas, you create this, but replenish the stock. Like the Scotland um, Football Association, they were promoting it on their website, replenish the stocks. Like mm -hmm. for me, it's it's crazy that people, when people say there isn't money in sport, because I am actively trying to give you my money mm -hmm. and you're making it really difficult for me. Yeah, I think that's a really good point. It's it's basic economic supply and demand. And, and I think there is a demand and that's what I don't understand. Like, mm -hmm any of the sessions you've tuned into as part of this summit or any of the conversations you follow, there is a demand for it. Like even in my household, my, my family, we want to consume women's football alongside male's football. So I have young children, 10 and under, and I was really proud of the fact that they, they watch football and they wouldn't say, oh, look, it's the man's, it's men's game. They're just like, oh, look, football's on, let's watch football. Mm -hmm. Football, that's what they see. They all play it, that's what they see. They just want to consume it. They want to buy it, they want to watch it, they want to dress up in it, they want to have posters. It's just football to them. They're 10 and under. At what point does that stop and it becomes, oh, but men's football? 
oh, and women's football is over here. Like if we, <laughs> they want it, like you're saying, Maggie, we want to consume it. But how do I watch, you know, the, the era division women's league over here? How do I watch it? How do I consume it? How do I become mm -hmm. part of it? I think that's a really interesting, the demand is there. So supply mm -hmm. it to us. Yeah. Kalinda, what's it like, um, again, in, from your perspective, do you, do you feel that demand from fans that, that want um, to consume women's football? Yes, like as I mentioned before, like once it's visible and it's out there, like the fans want that. The fans really feel it. The fans want to 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 just be go all in. Um, the the thing with uh, the the challenges right now we have, it's unfortunately in most of the football clubs, most of uh, football federations, the wrong people is leading women football. Hmm. We, unfortunately, we have very limited right people. Like I'm not talking about like gender, like both men and women. There, for example, there are men who uh, have like who love to be in the football industry, but unfortunately, their uh, their ability is not like into the into up to the standards to compete the male industry. Where, for example, working in in for men's football, but then end up in women's football, where they have no interest. They don't know about women's football. They don't have any interest, but because they are CVs or like uh, has more like experience or uh, like more um, stuff in their CVs. So, for example, that they end up in women's football and they have no interest in women's football. That's why the women's football, like for example, when they go to the sponsors, when you don't go with the with the passion, with the love, where you want to pitch the women's football to to sponsors, they don't see the value there. If you are not there, if you don't have interest, that's why most of the clubs, they are just doing it for just ticking the box or the wrong people is leading women's football, unfortunately. Uh, we need right people. We need people, both men and women, who loves women's football, who wants to be in women's football, who understands women's football. That's where the changes will take place. And, we, and then we see more, more women's football and also we, we see more growth and development in women's football. Um, unfortunately, the, there are very limited people um, in very well-developed countries. I think that's maybe like the case, not like the, the kind of diversity or the people that support women's sport and football. It's not just in, in who leads football, but also in all those other elements, like whether it's the, um, the people that are in sponsorship or marketing mm -hmm. or uh, in the broadcasters, who decides what's on television, who decides what to sponsor. Mm -hmm. And I think that um, like a personal example from, for, from a, I happened to be in a sports marketing meeting a couple of years ago um, before I was at Lewis. Um, and in that meeting, people were pitching their new ideas for adverts for uh, sport. Um, it, a bit of a strange reason why I was there. Um, in the room, I kind of, I, I noticed that there was six, six or seven women out of about of 100. So already the dynamic was a little bit weird. This guy presented this video, this advert. The, the advert was really cool and glossy. And it's for a company that actually does sponsor a lot of women's sports, cricket and netball, and uh, one of the big clubs here in, in England. And, um, and this really glossy video. And I think that, that there was one tiny, maybe nanosecond, of a, of a female footballer who I think might have been the England captain, but it wasn't quite clear. And the rest of the video was um, lots of recognizable men's football and lots of like, you know, and at the end, I, I just, and everyone clapped at the end and I was, it was a great video, it was fantastic. And at the end, I, I asked a question, which was simply, was it a strategic decision not to include women in this advert? Um, and I wasn't trying to catch him out. I was genuinely like, you, you put a lot of money into women's sport. What, is it a strategic decision? Does that not sell? And the guy just got so flustered. He's like, oh, gender equality is very important to me. And I was like, no, I wanted to talk about strategy. Was it a strategic <laughs> tactical decision? But I realized that when he goes back, if he goes to those types of meetings, and if he's talking to a room where there's 93 uh, men and seven women, and only one of the women spoke up to go, uh, it's just positively reinforcing this, like, oh, we've got this brilliant, glossy advert, um, and it's brilliant, and all the, all the marketing and advertising people love it. Um, and I shouldn't have really been in that meeting. I was kind of not meant to be there, but I was the only one that, that kind of called that out. And I think that that kind of thing is happening across lots of um, boardrooms and in lots of decision-making, and that's why you need to shake it up so that there's different perspectives going, hey, that's brilliant, but how about you include like, more clips of X, Y, Z? 
It's so important. And that's that's the basis of diversity and inclusion in any sector, in any space, is because if we all look the same and we all have the same opinion, we all see the same thing, right? So and the, the point of having diversity in your decision making is so that there is the person in the room that says, um, excuse me, but I don't see myself in here. Where, where am I? Uh, maybe you're not selling to me and that's fine. Like then I shouldn't be in your advertising campaign. But if you are trying to sell to me and I don't see myself, like we recently did a webinar uh, sharing some of our research and we created um, an infographic and I was looking for images of women coaches to put in the infographic. And I was looking for kind of the cartoony kind of images and I couldn't find what I was looking for. I couldn't find women football coaches and I couldn't find any with different skin colors or that looked like that, 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 what I was looking for. And I, I happened to get a friend um, who's a graphic designer and I said, look, can you create me something like this? And can you give me that image with several different skin colors and can you a different kit? And can she actually be m looking like she's moving and not just you know, holding a ball in a certain way because she looked like she's playing football because she looked like she's coaching. And the response that we got, that's an infographic. So that's a flat piece, A4, just one image. And the amount of feedback we got from women that said, this is the first time I've seen myself mm -hmm. in any kind of webinar or any yeah. kind of presentation about football. Thank you. I can see myself. Mm -hmm. I've been working in this industry for 30 years and I don't see myself. And I think... That's what's so important as well as about that representation. It brings us back to where we started about women being invisible. You mm. know, like you said, Maggie, why you may not have been in that, supposed to have been in that room, but somebody should have been in that room mm. to raise these questions. It's so important. And even if I, I guess the other thing is that if I um, was in that room, it also meters everyone else. So maybe somebody else would have asked the question, mm -hmm. hey, what about what about the women? Um, because I think the more that there's kind of, once you diversify a room, basically you you check yourself and you mm -hmm. have to be aware of other people's contexts and situations. So it shouldn't always be the black person that talks about yeah. black lives. Matter. It shouldn't be the woman that's talking about um, equality, gender equality. So, uh, but once you put all those people in there, then everyone is more conscious and conscientious mm -hmm. about each other's um, needs, perspectives. Uh, and I think that that's the whole point behind diversity. It's about uh, coming to something which is, uh, that works for everyone, not just the not just you know the, the people that are talking the people that are around that that board table and like we said earlier it's about make turning on that light switch so that that's how you see the world so it's not a tick box like Clinda mm -hmm. you were saying it's not just oh I need to tick this box and I need to tick mm -hmm. that box and it is like I feel like when I listen to you Maggie talking about Lewis it's a mindset it's a culture it's what we do it has to be in your cultural DNA it has to be in everything it's not just about oh you know, have we got the right image on this particular, if you have to count diversity, you're not doing it. It's not, you know, you're, you're not there yet. If we have to count, if we have to tick boxes, you're not there yet. So it has to just be in everything that, mm -hmm. that we do and, and, and see and think about. And on that, can I just, I would like to add that I think it's not bringing the women in after you've put something together to say, oh, does this meet this criteria? But it's including them in the conversations from the beginning. So you already have that feedback. It isn't like, oh, we put all this effort in and now we're raising the different issue that we didn't include this, this group. We only included the people that look like us. We, if those discussions are done with a diverse boards and divor diverse management, and diverse decision makers, then you don't have to have that after the fact conversation that has to go back and fix something. It just mm -hmm. becomes part of the program. It becomes part of how you're running your organization. And I think that's at many levels across all levels of sports, whether that's coaching, whether that's the marketing, it, you know, that early inclusion prevents any issues later on and makes it just sort of a, a natural part of it, normalizing the conversations. Yeah, I think that's a really important part as well about where where people are in the decision making within the clubs, within the performance pathways, you know, whether we're looking at keeping girls in sport. Uh, it, it's everything we do. It's got to be holistic and everything. It can't just be we need more. I think the IOC has been really good at getting women participation levels up in, in, in the Olympics, for example. But we know that coaches are women coaches at the Olympics, 11 percent at best. So we focus on one area and then we're like, oh, well, you know, maybe if we get enough to play, then there'll be coaches, then there'll be 
board members, then there'll be fans, as opposed to this holistic, just mm -hmm. make sport a space for everybody. Every part of sport should be a, a place for, for everybody. I think that's a big, a big difference. Um, guys, I'm, I'm realizing we've got about five minutes left. Is there anything else we've not talked about in this uh, conversation that we want to kind of, uh, we want to address, we want to discuss in the last five minutes? I would like to actually add one thing that uh, for me, like being in this um, in this industry for such a long time now, I would love to 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 like see more women and men, especially who are interested in women's football, is stop copying women's football. We should all stop copying. We should stop following men's football. We should stop comparing our women's football to men's stuff. Uh, football. We should just focus on what is the women's football identity? What is it that we want? What is this product about? We as like being in this industry, we need to find out. We need to find what is this beautiful and unique thing about that we should just talk about that instead of like fighting like all the time and comparing ourselves to men's game. I would love to copy of course some of the positive things from men's football but we need to have our own identity and stop like fighting and comparing ourselves to men's football. Absolutely, I love that, Clinda. I'm always telling my students, can we do for women's for women's uh, football what Netflix did for like uh, TV consumption? Can we just be that disruptive? Can mm -hmm. we look at things differently? Can we, like you said, take the best from the men's game, but also? you know, own our own stuff and say, okay, but, you know, and we do, I am seeing this in other federations in the Netherlands, for example, I have seen, uh, because the women are doing really well, I have seen the conversation twist to what can we learn from the women, because they're doing really well. So I do see the conversation changing, but I would mm -hmm. like to see more of that. Definitely, for sure. Mm -hmm. I'm just going to say, uh, before we, we finish off our session, let's have a look at what's coming up in uh, tomorrow's sessions. There we go, so we can see some exciting new different speakers, so much more to come on the summit tomorrow. So please join us again tomorrow to look at some of these guest speakers, panel discussions, talking about everything to do with the serious business that is women's football. Hey guys, before I wrap it up, it's uh, it's evening time here, afternoon for, for you in, in America. Sarah, is there anything else you'd like to say? What's your final kind of message um, for that you want to send out there? I guess I'd like to say, think about um, inclusion and diversifying things as soon as you can. I think then it avoids a lot of issues later on. Uh, we'd encourage anyone to get involved with just having the conversation to normalize women's involvement in all aspects of that in the game and normalizing that, whether that's getting involved in the sports bar project or getting involved in whatever community you are in, um, put women in that room, put them in in decision-making roles and normalize their involvement from childhood all the way through from. Um, definitely, definitely. Kalinda, any last thoughts? Um, I'm looking so much forward to see more women's football in, in all channels and more, more women's football and more, more uh, improvement in women's football and more uh, women, uh, female role models. We need for our new generation, like my generation grow up seeing men as a, their role model, but I love to see new generations seeing more female role models and, and follow their footsteps. Absolutely, absolutely. Thank you. And Maggie, any final thoughts? Yeah, well, maybe the, everyone has a role to play. So go and watch mm -hmm. women's football. Um, talk about women's football. Mind your language when you talk about, you know, throwing or playing like a girl. That's, and then also be an ally and like tell other people, hey, that's not cool. I think being being an ally is really, really important right now. And then I think kind of wrapping up other things, if for women that are involved in, uh, in football, if you see a door or a group of people and you don't want to be in there because it all looks quite fusty and you need to get in there. <laughs> Be like Maggie, just be in the room that you didn't know you were supposed to be in and then speak exactly. up and tell them what they're doing. <laughs> be more Maggie is the way that we're going to leave that. Thank you so much, Good ladies, job. for your time, your energy, your conversation, your thoughts. Really appreciate it. I could talk like this for hours, so thank you very much. For anybody that's watching us either live Thanks. or later, 
you see our names on here you can reach out to us on any platforms mm -hmm. and engage in the conversation further and um, like Maggie said follow the club buy into the club <laughs> buy the t-shirt <laughs> <laughs> And um, just as a reminder for any students out there, we are having a forum on Friday. I think Maggie, you might be joining us for that again. I'm not sure. On Friday, um, the Hague University of Applied Sciences, we're hosting a student forum because we're passionate about getting the next generation of sport managers to join this conversation and have this perspective um, of inclusion and equity and diversity in everything that they do. So for any students out there, you can still sign up for your free seat and join the conversation with us on Friday. And stay tuned for more sessions tomorrow. But for now, thanks a lot, ladies. Really appreciated it. And let's do it again soon. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.